Good evening, Liberty family, and happy Easter, and welcome to Joyful Noise with Preston. This will be a new podcast for our church family that explores the world of church music. We hope all of you are doing well and keeping safe amidst the situation we are facing right now, but we can be thankful for the ability to gather in fellowship by way of the internet, even though we cannot gather in person at the moment. Another positive side to this unprecedented situation is that it has forced us to become creative with our ministry, and it has motivated us to explore opportunities that allow us to use technology to our advantage. I personally want to thank each and every one of you for supporting our church by listening online and by your kind words of encouragement during our live casts and our Facebook posts. All of the comments really mean a whole lot to us, and so do all of the encouragement that every one of us has been sharing, or every one of you has been sharing, and we thank you so much for that. On top of that, we have already decided these new technological changes will continue once we can celebrate together when we return to church and worship together in person. Since these new measures have allowed our church a means to improve certain ministries, I would like to begin a new live cast for our church that focuses on the significance of music, why it is important in worship, and its historical and spiritual meaning. Every one of these live casts will be posted to our church Facebook page and will also be podcasted on Anchor, which I will put a link later on for, for you to check out. Just like with any important radio or TV show, I realize this, pos- this podcast needs a title, so we are going to call this Joyful Noise. I am so excited about this inaugural live cast of Joyful Noise, and I look forward to seeing how this new ministry will hopefully impact our church in a positive way and help all of you develop a deeper understanding of the music we use in worship. I plan to provide all kinds of musical topics that cover everything from early church music all the way through modern times and how it all connects with us as the body of Christ. Since Easter is upon us, and there are so many wonderful pieces of music that revolve around every different major event we celebrate as a church, I could think of nothing more significant to share than the topic of Handel's Messiah. Now, there are many aspects of Messiah that are common knowledge. For example, we honor the tradition of standing when we hear the Hallelujah Chorus, and we know the tradition was born from King George II of England standing when he heard this magnificent piece, or at least that's what we think. We commonly know that Messiah is a collection of pieces of music that tell the story of Jesus and that it is divided into a Christmas and an Easter portion. What many people do not know about Messiah is why it was written to begin with, how quickly it was written, the truth behind why King George II actually stood to his feet during the Hallelujah Chorus, and the circumstances upon which Messiah premiered, along with its initial purpose of serving as an instrumental element in helping those who were less fortunate. I have always believed if you want to understand the significance of a certain piece of music, you must first understand the person who composed it. George Friedrich Handel was born on February 23rd, 1685 in Halle, Germany, into a well-placed but non-musical family. 1685 was a golden year for Baroque music, as it also saw the birth of Johann Sebastian Bach, who was born almost one month after Handel. As a child, Handel longed to study music, but his father objected and expressed doubts that music would be a realistic source of income. In fact, his father would not even allow him to possess a musical instrument, but his mother was more supportive and secretly allowed Handel to sneak into the attic of the house to play on the clavichord, which pretty much looks like a cross between a piano and a laptop computer. He went on He went on to study music and learn how to play the organ and the violin. And by the time he was 16, he was already composing church music. Despite this musical dedication, Handel's father insisted that he study law to which he initially agreed to. But that did not last for long. The death of his father, combined with his unwavering passion for music, allowed Handel the freedom to pursue what he loved without any constraints. In 1703, at the age of 18, Handel committed himself completely to music and began to perform on the violin while supplementing his income by teaching private music lessons, which is still common practice today for musicians. 
In 1706, Handel moved to Italy where he spent a few years composing operas until 1710 when he became interested in London's musical scene and took an opportunity to compose music in England. Over the next 16 years, Handel rose to national fame, becoming today's equivalent of a rock star, by composing music for England's most prestigious musical establishments and even performing for the King and Queen of England. In 1726, Handel chose to make London his permanent home and officially became a subject of the British crown. It was also during the next several years Handel's prestige would continue to rise as he became director of the Royal Academy of Music, where he composed music for the coronation of King George II in 1727. One of his anthems, entitled Zadok the Priest, has been performed at every British coronation ceremony since that date. Then in 1741, Handel premiered his Messiah in Dublin, Ireland, which has now become recognized as a landmark in music history. Handel died on April 14, 1759, 17 years almost to the day after Messiah premiered in Dublin. He was buried in Westminster Abbey in London with full honors as Messiah was played at his funeral with over 3,000 people in attendance. Handel composed many pieces we now revere to this day as some of the greatest works of the Baroque period, but in the Christian world, none of those pieces shine as brightly as Messiah and its significance in telling the story of Jesus. In fact, Messiah has in many ways eclipsed much of Handel's other works that warrant perhaps the same level of reverence. Today we sing and listen to music from Messiah mainly around both Christmas and Easter, but it was originally intended to celebrate Easter. It was not until later in history that Messiah was adopted as a work that also celebrates Christmas. So let's get into the inspiration behind Messiah and how it truly connects with Christ's ministry. The inspiration for Messiah came from a British scholar named Charles Jennings, who was a devout Christian and a wealthy supporter of the arts. Jennings assembled a set of Bible verses taken from Isaiah, Malachi, Psalms, Matthew, Luke, Revelation, and a few others, which he sent to Handel in July of 1741 and asked him to use these verses as the libretto for the Messiah, or what we would call a storyline. Jennings wrote in a letter to his friend, Edward Holdsworth, quote, I hope Handel will lay out his whole genius and skill upon it, that the composition may excel all his former compositions as the subject excels every other subject. The subject is... Messiah. The verses were drawn from three parts of the Bible, which include the prophecies of Jesus' birth found in the Old Testament and the New Testament accounts of the birth of Christ, his death, and his resurrection, along with verses from Revelation relating to the return of Jesus. Jennings described this work as, quote, a meditation of our Lord as Messiah in Christian thought and belief. Upon receiving these Bible verses, Handel immediately began composing Messiah on August 22, 1741, and completed the work on September 14, the same year. The original score's 259 pages were composed in the course of 24 days, which even by today's standards, if Handel was working with modern technology, his accomplishment would be considered lightning fast. In order to put this in perspective, it is estimated that Handel composed a total of 250,000 notes for Messiah. This means Handel would have worked more than three weeks straight for 10 hours per day, composing at a pace of 15 notes per minute, and that's with a quill. At the end of the manuscript, Handel wrote the letters SDG, which mean Soli Deo Gloria, the Latin phrase for To God Alone the Glory. Johann Sebastian Bach adopted this same practice at the end of his pieces as well. It is even believed, though scholars do argue the validity, that when Handel completed the Hallelujah Chorus, he said with tears streaming down his face, I did think I did see all of heaven before me and the great God himself. We like to believe the first performance of Messiah took place in the majestic scene that is Westminster Abbey, with the King and Queen of England in attendance gazing into a choir of 200 voices and a full symphony orchestra. But in fact, 
The Handel's Messiah we know and love today came from humble beginnings and is a highly revised and altered version of what originally premiered in Dublin, Ireland on April 13, 1742. In fact, the first performance of Messiah was a benefit concert meant to raise money for three different charities in Dublin that offered help for those in debtor's prison as well as hospital patients. However, even though Messiah premiered to a relatively small event, it was very well received. Over 700 people attended the first concert at the Great Music Hall in Dublin. And due to limited space, gentlemen were asked to remove their swords and ladies were asked not to wear hoops in their dresses. The premiere of Messiah was a great success and ended up generating enough money to help secure the release of 142 indebted prisoners. The performance of Messiah, the performance of Messiah, where the tradition of standing for the Hallelujah Chorus took place roughly a year later in London on March 23, 1743, at the Royal Opera House. It is believed King George II attended this concert, but we really don't know for sure why he stood for the Hallelujah Chorus. There are many conflicting theories as to the true reason he stood. Some believe the king was so moved by the music that he stood up to show his reverence and respect. And since it was expected of all subjects of the British crown to stand when the king stood, the audience followed suit. Another theory scholars offer is that the king's gout acted up and he stood in an effort to relieve the pain. Others believe he stood at the beginning of the Hallelujah Chorus, but was confused and he thought it was the end of the piece. This theory does make some sense as George II suffered hearing issues later in life as he was the last British king to actually lead men on the battlefield. And finally, there is the practical theory which says the king was simply tired of sitting for such a long time and wanted to stretch his legs. There's some truth in that as well because the full length of Messiah is roughly three hours long. The precise factual reason for standing during the Hallelujah Chorus is a mystery to this very day, especially when we realize the first written mention of George II attending the London premiere of Messiah occurs 37 years later, which raises the question of whether or not he attended the premiere at all. But regardless of all these different mysteries being tossed back and forth, the tradition of standing during the Hallelujah Chorus is now seen as one of rising for our heavenly king, as it was traditional for subjects to stand for their earthly king. Around 1784, John Newton, the man who wrote Amazing Grace, preached a series of sermons on the scriptural passages Genesis had selected for Messiah. About the Hallelujah Chorus, Newton observed, quote, The impression which the performance of this passage in the oratorio usually makes upon the audience is well known. But do the professed lovers of sacred music in this enlightened age generally live as if they really believed that the Lord God omnipotent reigneth? Newton directly quoted the Hallelujah Chorus as an example for how we should worship out of respect and a desire from our own hearts rather than from a sense of obligation and a sense of following tradition. Regardless of whether or not George II was at the London premiere of Messiah or any other theories and stories that surround the reception of its first performance, the real story of how Handel's Messiah became an international treasure founded in the core message of Jesus Christ began in London in 1742, around the same time as the Dublin premiere. Following 17 years of campaigning, the philanthropist and sea captain Thomas Coram was granted a royal charter by George II to establish a new charity to care for babies in London who would otherwise have been abandoned by mothers who were unable to care for them. In 1742, on the northern edge of London, the foundation stone had been laid for the Foundling Hospital, a major new public building that would serve the purpose of caring for these babies. Thomas Coram, who spent 40 years of his life at sea and building ships in the American colonies, came home later in life and was shocked to the core at what he saw in London, with so many children, most of them babies, being forced to live in such horrible conditions. Coram's mission was to force London to see what was happening right in front of them, not only by building the Foundling Hospital, 
but collaborating with both artists and musicians to attract the general public into seeing the problem firsthand and donating money to this cause. As the hospital was nearing completion, many British artists from the Baroque period, including William Hogarth, Joshua Reynolds, Alan Ramsey, and Thomas Gainsborough, wanted to establish the founding hospital in the public's imagination. Since there were no public art galleries at this time in London, it became a win-win situation because artists were able to donate their works for display in the foundling hospital, effectively creating the UK's first public art gallery. It gave the general public a reason to visit the, the foundling hospital, where, in addition to all the fine artwork, they would also see the children at mealtime and singing in the chapel, and they would feel led to donate money to their cause. All of this caught Handel's attention, and in 1749, he approached the hospital's governors and offered to conduct a benefit concert. The program included the first performance of Handel's Foundling Hospital Anthem, which opens with a text adapted from Psalm 41. Blessed are they that consider the poor and needy. They deliver the poor that crieth the fatherless. In a clear appeal to the audience to support the work of the hospital. The music also included various selections of Handel's previous works and ended with the Hallelujah Chorus. The benefit concert was a huge success both musically and financially, and soon after Handel donated an, an organ to the new chapel. The following year he returned to conduct a second benefit concert for the Foundling Hospital, and this time he chose Messiah. The event was so crowded the hospital was forced to turn away wealthy donors for the night. Handel was asked to repeat the concert two weeks later so those who could not see the previous concert were able to attend. To show its gratitude, the hospital made Handel a governor, which is much like being named to the board of directors. From then on, Messiah was performed each year in the Foundling Hospital Chapel as a benefit concert to raise money for the charity, which was either conducted or attended by Handel every year until his death in 1759. These concerts helped secure Messiah's place in the nation's affections and succeeded in raising a sum of 7,000 British pounds, which translates to roughly 1.5 million U.S. dollars today. As a final act of generosity, Handel left in his will a copy of the Messiah score to the governors of the Foundling Hospital, which enabled them to continue staging benefit concerts using the music of Handel's Messiah. Today, the Foundling Hospital is now a museum that celebrates the way in which artists of all disciplines have been inspired to improve children's lives since 1740. Jesus brought with him a new way of forming a relationship with God and completely changed the way we as Christians should relate with each other in the name of love and fellowship. One of the most important values he taught us through his ministry on this earth came from his parable of the sheep and the goats, found in Matthew 25, where he says in verses 35 through 40, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry went and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus was very clear in that we are called not only to appreciate what we have and count our blessings, we are also called to help those who are less fortunate than ourselves and use the spiritual gifts we are blessed with to share his love with those who may not know him. Handel saw a cause he believed in because his devotion to his faith and his relationship with Christ formed a desire in his heart to use his talents and abilities to help those who were less fortunate. And what better example, what better figure to use as inspiration for a musical performance than the one who preached this type of compassion as a core value of our faith, the Messiah. Handel was able to share Christ in music while at the same time bring the message of the prophecy of his birth, his coming into the world, his death, his resurrection, and ascension into heaven, and finally his, ret his return, all in an oratorio that, was, that has sealed its place in history called Messiah. 
Handel's influence and faith made an impression among those who carried the torch after his death. Handel himself once said, quote, What a wonderful thing it is to be sure of one's faith. How wonderful to be a member of the evangelical church, which preaches the free grace of God through Christ as the hope of sinners. If we are to rely on our works, my God, what would become of us? Franz Joseph Haydn, who composed music alongside Mozart, once said of Handel with tears in his eyes after listening to the Hallelujah ch Chorus, quote, He is the master of us all. And Beethoven said of Handel, He is the greatest composer that ever lived. I would uncover my head and kneel before his tomb. This Palm Sunday, let's remember what this time of year represents for all of us and what it means for us who know Christ and our calling for carrying the message of Jesus to those who do not know him. I pray all of you have a blessed, and above all, given the circumstances, I pray that you have a safe Easter. I certainly hope and pray you found this piece of history useful, as the history of music and its connection with our faith is a subject I am deeply passionate about. Being your minister of music here at Liberty and serving God by your side while working alongside Pastor Derek and Michael has been an absolute joy from the start, and I am looking forward to when we all get together again to worship in person. This is the first of what I hope will be many more podcasts where I get to share with you different stories and significant happenings with church music. I pray this was a blessing to all of you, and I wish all of you the very best.